The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half and the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 70, The Man of Blood. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Before we begin today, thank you to my Patreon House of Lords, who help keep this podcast going, and who have been joined by the second Earl of Pembroke, Amir Latifi. John Christoph has been promoted to Dr. John Christoph, Earl of the Near Earth Trojans, Horseshoes and Quasi Satellites, or the Celestial Highlands and Islands, the Earl of Gloucester, Evan, and Devon, Baron Morris. Like all of the patrons, they can now listen to this episode and every other episode ad-free. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. Last time, we gave the Royalist cause in the Second English Civil War and the War of the Engagement an autopsy, because it was dead on arrival. Too many moving parts, too far apart and too out of sync meant that the smaller but more unified and decisive new model army was able to deal with each uprising, rebellion or invasion in turn. Charles I had hoped that this roll of the dice would get him out of the hole he'd already dug for himself, and instead it just sent him deeper. He had once again shown himself to be untrustworthy and insincere in his negotiations, and his actions had meant even more death, destruction and suffering for his subjects. In the view of a growing minority, and most importantly within the army, Charles Stuart had fully earned the biblical title of the Man of Blood. After the unity, or thereabouts, between Parliament and the New Model Army during the war, the defeat of their shared enemy brought their pre-war divisions right back into the limelight. The officers of the army, Cromwell and Henry Ireton especially, had run out of patience for the king. They would have no truck with the man Charles Stuart, the man of blood who had shed so much, and over the next few months, the position of the army grandees and many of their men was that Charles would either accept a forced deal, neutering his position and the role of the crown in government, or he would be brought to trial, convicted of treason against the people of England, and punished, either by being deposed and imprisoned for the rest of his life, or by ending that life. But this hardline position, forged in the siege trenches and battlefields of the Second Civil War, was not shared by everyone. Many people, a sizable portion of London and Parliament and across the Kingdom, just wanted peace. They wanted the King back on his throne, although with serious restrictions on his power, and for things to go back to something like normal. If that required a negotiated settlement, so be it. Yes, Charles had bargained in bad faith last year, and the year before. 
But after the Second Civil War and the clear defeat of the Royalist rebels and the Scottish engagers, surely even Charles knew that he had to come to terms. The political Presbyterians in Parliament could now bank on popular support for a settlement on their terms, which would secure Presbyterianism in England and place limits on the monarch's power. Public pressure in favour of a settlement grew. The parliamentary victory in the recent war was a crushing one, but it did nothing to hide how unpopular both the Long Parliament and the New Model Army were in England and the other two kingdoms. They spent most of the summer putting down riots and rebellions in England, and foreign invasion had just come from Scotland, and another was threatened from Ireland. In September 1648, the London Common Council petitioned Parliament to come to terms with Charles. The terrible economic situation, after another wet summer and a third failed harvest, was causing famine, exacerbated by the wars. With the political momentum behind them, a peace faction in Parliament sent a commission of 15 men to the Isle of Wight to try and negotiate with the King once again. The makeup of the commission was surprisingly well adjusted. Five men were Presbyterians, including Denzel Halls, and six men were Independents, including Henry Vane the Younger, Nathaniel Fiennes, the Earl of Northumberland, and Viscount Say and Seal. The remaining four men were neutral peers. This was a bipartisan attempt to bring the conflicts of the last decade to an end. This commission arrived in the town of Newport, where they met with the king. And things started well, since it appeared that both sides were willing to compromise. Charles agreed to surrender control over the militia for 20 years, which was effectively until the end of his expected lifespan. He was almost 50 at this point. Parliament reduced the number of royalists who would be exempt from a pardon after the king bitterly resisted abandoning his loyal supporters. But of course, religion remained a sticking point for both sides. Despite the fact that Presbyterianism was, officially, an established fact for two years now, and the bishop's land had been sold the previous year, Charles refused to accept this. This prompted Denzel Halls to fall onto his knees before the king and sob, begging Charles to accept this key condition. If you remember, this had been central to Hall's plan the previous year. To make the religious reforms he and his allies required, removing any easy way for the episcopacy to be restored, and only then to come to terms with Charles, the king would be presented with a fait accompli, and he'd have to say yes. Except now, Hall's was in front of the king with his fait accompli, and Charles still said no. I have to imagine that some of those tears were tears of frustration, and if they were, that feeling was definitely shared by the king's advisers, who were kept behind a curtain in an adjoining room listening in. This was, by the way, acceptable to the parliamentary commissioners, they weren't doing it polonious. When Charles withdrew for a break and to consult his advisers, they agreed with Halls. The king had to accept reality. But for Charles, the existing Church of England, as it existed before the war, of course, the Book of Common Prayer, the bishops, all of it, he sincerely believed that it was the true church, and he had never wavered in this belief until now. Ian Gentles quotes a letter the king sent to his son, Charles, two years before, where he spells out why, in the face of an unstoppable force, he remained an immovable object. The chief particular duty of a king is to maintain the true religion, without which he can never expect to have God's blessing. So I assure you that this duty can never be right performed without the church be rightly governed. For take it as an infallible maxim from me that as the church can never flourish without the protection of the crown, so the dependency of the church upon the crown is the chiefest support of regal authority. Wherefore my first direction to you is to be constant in the maintenance of episcopacy. I think that neatly sums it up. For Charles, the maintenance of the existing Church of England was both a spiritual responsibility for the sovereign and supreme governor, and a key pillar of royal government. To echo his father, no bishops, no king. For both divine and mundane reasons, the Church was one line he would not cross. Until he did. Through tears, in October, Charles finally compromised. He proposed to surrender episcopacy for three years, and in return he wanted the return of his incomes, an act of oblivion for both royalists and parliamentarians, 
and an acknowledgement that he refused to swear to the Solemn League and Covenant. On the 27th of October, the Commons considered these proposals and dismissed them, but they voted to extend the negotiation period until at least December. At this point, Charles had still not given up hope that he could still come out of this with his power and his beloved church intact, because of course he did. This was Charles I. In Ireland, the Marquis of Ormond was still cobbling together a royalist and confederate alliance, and Charles began plotting another escape. Was this offer of compromise merely buying time for both plots to come to fruition? Historians are divided. Anyway, while Parliament and the King were making nice, the army was glowering from the sidelines. For starters, their intelligence apparatus was nothing to sniff at, and they quickly learned that the King was planning to escape, which only confirmed their beliefs that Charles was not an honest broker. As Gentles puts it, quote, the officers could not comprehend why he should be treated as anything less than a moral leper, end quote. The parliamentarians who were upholding this facade of a negotiation were either fools or traitors to the cause they had fought for. Suspicions against the peacemakers grew. Were they planning to destroy the army? None of the grandees had forgotten the previous year, when the political Presbyterians had been enemies of the army, and they were back in the driving seat and using the popular desire for peace to prop them up. The army grandees would not permit a weak peace to be agreed with a man they thought should be put on trial for treason. In September, Fairfax moved his headquarters from Colchester, where it had been since the siege, to St Albans, which was much closer to London. Fairfax is traditionally seen as a political cipher, and he will, like the previous year, mostly keep his head down during the political debates of this period. But he was no fool, and he knew that the army would have to be a player in this arena if it had any chance of achieving its political and practical goals. Like the political Presbyterians, another legacy of 1647 returned with a vengeance. The Levellers. On the 11th of September, the Levellers presented the large petition to Parliament. This document, signed by reportedly a third of all Londoners, denounced the negotiations with the King which were due to begin a week from then. After a preamble which explains exactly why Parliament shouldn't negotiate with the King, it lists 27 points which are framed as things the petitioners expected Parliament to have done by now, but which it hadn't. Of these, there were the expected points of the levellers, calling for equality before the law, reform of the electoral system, and the primacy of the House of Commons over both the House of Lords and the King. But it also has point 25, which calls for, quote, justice upon the capital authors and promoters of the former or late wars, many of them being under your power, considering that mercy to the wicked is cruelty to the innocent, end quote. Parliament would mostly ignore this petition, but the army would not. The association between radical army officers and soldiers and civilians became stronger during these months. The scattered regiments and garrisons across the kingdom began dispatching petitions to Parliament and to Fairfax, calling for justice against the architects of the latest war. Many of these petitions had the level of flavour of social revolution. But these didn't just come from the army and there was a genuine surge in petitions from ordinary people who agreed that the king could not be trusted and called on Parliament not to make a deal with him. When news of Rainsborough's death reached London, or was it an assassination, questioned the pamphleteers, leveller sympathy rose again, and when his body was carried through the streets in his funeral, it was accompanied by a march of 3,000 levellers, soldiers and civilians. Later in September, Fairfax summoned the Council of the Army to gather at St Albans. One notable absence from this meeting, and it's an absence that will carry on until December, was one Lieutenant General Oliver Cromwell. As we left off last time, he was busying himself with the Northern Castles, which were still held by Royalist holdouts. But his absence was noted, and many, then and now, regard it as suspicious. Once this meeting convened, sans Cromwell, it first began considering the flood of petitions from various army regiments and how best to proceed. And then Henry Ireton struck, said that he had a solution, and slammed down the first draft of what would become the Remonstrance of the Army. So, 
let's talk about the Army Remonstrance. The Remonstrance opens by stating, Salus Populi Suprema Lex. The welfare of the people is the supreme law. This is core to the Remonstrance. It both justified the army's intervention into political affairs, and is their key charge against King Charles. The king had committed the crime of violating his subjects' rights and liberties, which he had sworn to uphold in his coronation oath. As such, he had absolved his subjects from their responsibility to obey him. When Charles attempted to force the issue, and implement his tyranny by military arms, he had been defeated after massive bloodshed. Then he tried again, leading to even more death and destruction. Worse, he was planning another invasion, this time from Ireland. If he was being faithful and sincere and truthful with his apparent compromises at Newport, why had he not called off Ormond yet? It went on to explain that the king was an oathbreaker, untrustworthy, and simply didn't have it in him to negotiate in good faith. Therefore, peacemakers in Parliament were fools for trying, and they should stop considering the terms of the Newport Treaty immediately. To try and unite this king with this Parliament was like trying to join, quote, light with darkness, good with evil. The man Charles Stuart was, through his actions, a criminal. Quote, we may justly say he is guilty of the highest treason against law among men, and guilty of all the innocent blood spilt thereby, end quote. Yet, despite this, the Remonstrance admits that he was still dangerously popular. If he was brought to London in anything other than chains, he could reassert himself and reject whatever promises he'd made to get there. With the case against the King made, the Remonstrance then sought to convince Parliament, many of whom had sworn to the Solemn League and Covenant, which obligated those who took it to preserve the King's person and position. The Remonstrance offered a loophole. When duty to king conflicted with duty to God and to the people, duty to the king must be discarded. Salus populi, suprema lex. Instead of the watered-down proposals of whatever was decided at Newport, which would threaten that public safety, the army remonstrance called for the dissolution of the long parliament, the redistribution of electoral boundaries, annual or at least biennial elections, and a new constitution which, in the view of Ian Gentles, implicitly abolished monarchical government, and only those who subscribed to it, the new constitution, would be eligible to participate in the country's political life, end quote. It would effectively remove any form of power from the crown, reduce the person of the monarch to a figurehead, and deny them any veto over legislation. Gentles calls the army remonstrance the, quote, master plan for the army's actions in the critical months ahead, and that it, quote, contains the chief theoretical justification for the coup d'etat known as Pride's Purge. Sean Kelsey has taken a more generous perspective on the remonstrance. He points out that the calls for justice against the king don't demand a specific fate for him. It charges Charles with tyranny, murder and treason against the people, and calls for him to stand trial for his crimes. But charges are not convictions, and the punishment demanded was not explicitly a death sentence. Clive Holmes has strongly countered Kelsey's conclusions, arguing that it requires an extremely literal reading of the text without considering the wider context, and ignoring any implications to focus on what was explicitly demanded. The remonstrance's calls for justice and the, quote, execution of justice, end quote, may be coded allusions to another kind of execution. The only explicit calls for capital punishment are not explicitly tied to Charles, but instead to the principal author and some key instruments of our late wars. The assumption is the king and particular royalists, like Hamilton, but it does give some wiggle room. Philip Baker argues that the remonstrance was, quote, a bold statement of the army's intent to kill the Newport negotiations rather than Charles Stuart, end quote. The Army Remonstrance was a radical document, in both its constitutional implications as well as its attitude towards the King and to the Long Parliament, and at first, Ireton struggled to find any agreement from the more moderate officers. Many of his fellow officers on the council, including Fairfax, still hoped for a settlement with the King, as long as they had a role in drafting that settlement. 
But Ayrton was able to win the council to his side through a combination of persuasion and events outside of the council. Ayrton now backed the agreement of the people, the leveller manifesto which he had very passionately opposed during the Putney debates of the previous year. This backing from the levellers helped Ayrton's position on the council, and in return, a new committee of 16 was appointed to consider a new constitution for the kingdom. The army, the levellers, the London independents, and the honest party, sympathetic MPs, were equally represented on the body. The other factor which helped Ayrton win the argument came on the 15th of November, when Parliament voted to bring the King to London to finish the negotiations over the Newport Treaty, and to restore the King to his lands and revenues. It looked for all the world like the political Presbyterians were about to accept a weak peace, sell out the causes which the army had fought and died for, and that Charles was about to get away with murder. On the 16th, the army council agreed to the remonstrance, and on either the 18th or the 20th, the army remonstrance was presented to the commons. Alongside it came an endorsement of the levellers' large petition from September, and a call for a new constitution based on the agreement of the people. The full text of the remonstrance was more than 25,000 words, and in the opinion of Jonathan Healy, 25,000 very badly written words. This meant that after it was presented to the Commons clerk, it took him four hours to read it all. And after all that, the Presbyterian majority in the Commons refused to even debate it, and postponed any debate on it for a week. For starters, the Remonstrance was a clear threat to the position of the MPs, since it called for the dissolution of that Parliament and the redistribution of political power. And whatever the mealy-mouthed wording of the Remonstrance, The MPs absolutely took it as calling for Charles to be put on trial for his life, and they were horrified at the very idea, especially as a settlement with the King was almost complete. If anything, the Remonstrance boosted support for the Newport Treaty. Things were getting out of hand, and they needed the King back now. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name. But you may not realize the historical significance of the woman behind the name or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France, and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Toussaint won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. Both Parliament and the army knew that they had to act soon. Furious that their remonstrance had been put aside by the Commons, 
Ayrton and his allies were prepared to pull the plug on the whole thing, dissolve Parliament outright, and call new elections. But the army still had friends in both the Commons and the Lords, and they managed to convince Ayrton and Fairfax along a different path. Why throw the baby out with the bathwater? Instead, there would be a purge. On the 23rd of November, Lord Grey, one of those army allies, visited the army headquarters at St Albans. At that meeting, they probably decided who would be purged and who would not. Two days later, the army headquarters moved from St Albans to Windsor Castle. Here, the army council held another prayer meeting, and the grandees were never more dangerous than after they'd been spiritually fortified. After this, they were suitably convinced they were still on course to enact God's will, and on the 28th of November, the political debate reopened on the army council. By the end of the meeting, everyone was in agreement. For the second time in just over a year, London would be occupied. As the soldiers began to march, history repeated itself in another way. The political Presbyterians in the Commons sent orders that the army must stay 40 miles away from London. It was just as effective as it had been the previous year. On the 30th, the army issued a declaration denouncing Parliament and praising upright MPs, those who opposed peace talks with the King. Meanwhile, Charles's plan to escape the Isle of Wight was foiled before it even began. The army knew all about it, of course, and on the stormy night of the 30th of November, a force of soldiers crossed the Solent. Charles, back in Carisbrook Castle, was writing a letter to Henrietta Maria when one of his servants rushed in. Dripping with rainwater, he warned the king that Newport was swarming with soldiers, and they were on the way to the castle. The standing garrison was quickly removed from their posts, and new men were put in their places. The next morning, the king was awoken at dawn by two of the soldiers, and then bundled into a coach. This was all very humiliating for the king, but there were still some things he would not tolerate, such as when Major Rolf, the commander of the soldiers, went to step into the coach. Charles was having none of that, and he stood out of his seat and shoved him out of the door. It is not come to that yet. Get you out. Then they rode to the coast, boarded a small boat, and sailed for three hours to the isolated fortress of Hurst Castle. Hurst stands on a jutting spit of land, right out into the Solent. Hurst was far more isolated than Carisbrook or Newport, and the king was as secure there as he could be. This move was also partly to take him out of the grasp of Hammond, whose loyalty to the army, rather than to Parliament, was doubted by the army council. Hammond had been removed from command of Carisbrook on the 21st, and would be briefly arrested on the orders of Fairfax, though he was quickly released. Another reason for moving Charles to the mainland, even an isolated place like Hurst, was to make his later transfer inland easier. On the 1st of December, at the same time that Charles was shoving army officers around, Fairfax was mustering 7,000 men in Hyde Park, and setting up his headquarters in Whitehall Palace. Meanwhile, the Commons debated the army remonstrance, and rejected it by 125 to 58. William Prynne, Lord's old enemy, attempted to have the House denounce the army as rebels and traitors. But it was too late. Army soldiers were all over London in a show of force. But despite coming to the threshold of Parliament, the army leadership held back. They were still torn, and they hoped that their presence in the capital would be enough to convince the Commons to act sensibly, and for their allies to block the Newport negotiations, or somehow orchestrate their own purge. The army did not want to cross that Rubicon if they could avoid it. However, those parliamentary allies knew how precarious their position was, and that the mood in the House was not moving towards the army. They urged Fairfax to intervene, but the Lord General still held out hope that the Commons would see sense. The Newport Treaty was coming up for debate. If the Commons rejected it as a basis for a settlement, the army would not have to cross the Rubicon. On the 4th of December, the main event kicked off. The Commons met, and voted to condemn the army's removal of the King from the Isle of Wight to Hurst. Then they began debating the latest terms of the Newport Treaty sent from the King. The debate lasted the whole day, and when daylight ran out, candles were brought in and it carried on into the night. 
and it carried on right until the candles burnt out and the sun rose in the early hours of the 5th. This was Parliament's own Rubicon. The army was camped right on their doorstep. It had made its position known, and its officers were watching from the galleries. If they voted to reject the terms, everyone would step away from the cliff edge. But it would hand the army the political initiative, and who knows what they would do with it. But if they voted to accept the king's terms as a basis for further negotiation, well, the army was right there. Everyone knew that the soldiers would not let it stand. After almost 24 hours of debate, a division took place. Were the king's proposals, quote, a ground for the house to proceed upon for the settlement of the peace of the kingdom? 129 eyes, 83 noes. The eyes had it. The army leadership was furious, up to and including Fairfax. A delegation from Parliament, probably very sleep-deprived, arrived at his headquarters to try and explain the decision of the House to try and head off any drastic repercussions. Fairfax wouldn't see them. Instead, he spent the day in meetings with the rest of the Council, in coordination with their parliamentary allies. Ireton still wanted to dissolve Parliament, worried that a purged Parliament would have no legitimacy, but he couldn't convince the room. The next day, the army was going to purge Parliament. A list was drawn up with two columns. The first were the names of 80 to 90 MPs who would be arrested, and in the second were the names of about 180 MPs who would be turned away at the doors. In the early hours of the 6th of December, Colonel Thomas Pride formed up his regiment, as well as the regiment of Nathaniel Rich, and surrounded the House of Commons. Shortly after, the trained bands, London's militia, arrived to take up their customary guard positions, only to find army soldiers ready and waiting for them. They were told to go home. Any resistance from the militia was quickly quieted when General Skippen arrived. He was beloved by his men, and he remained loyal to the army, and he told the London militiamen to withdraw. When the MPs began to arrive, they found their path lined with red-coated soldiers. Pride stood at the door to the lobby. He didn't know most of these MPs from Adam, so he was helped by allied MPs who helpfully confirmed the identities of those passing through. If they weren't on the list, in they went. If they were, well, it depended on the column they were in. Pride was apparently very courteous with all those he spoke to, and he'd even removed his hat, but he fulfilled his duty nonetheless. Between 41 and 45 MPs were arrested, including Sir William the Conqueror Waller, Edward Massey, and William Prynne. The rest were sent home. The arrested MPs were sent to hell. Hell was the name of the nearby tavern frequented by MPs. The other one was called Heaven, because those parliamentarians loved their jokes. But no one was laughing now. Their guards were informed that these were the men who had denied them their pay for so long, which didn't make them particularly keen to be considerate to their charges. They weren't given bedding, and in the morning they didn't receive any breakfast. Everyone had known that the army was going to react to Parliament's decision, and many of those who knew without a doubt that they were on Ireton's shit list would stay away. Hulls was one of those. After enough honest MPs were in attendance and a quorum was safely reached, the purged House of Commons was informed by the army that they were to carry on, quote, the execution of justice to set a short period to your own power, and to provide for a speedy succession of equal representation according to our late remonstrance, end quote. Pride's purge, as this event would become known, killed the Long Parliament. The Rump was all that was left, hence its new nickname, the Rump Parliament. It was an outright military coup d'etat. We'll end today with a question posed by Philip Baker. Did Pride's purge ensure the death of the Newport Treaty? Or did it also ensure the death of Charles I? Thank you to my House of Lords, the King's favourite, Mike Sanders, the Duchess of Wellington, Sue Bremner, the Marquis of Coventry, Liam Hunter, and the Earl of Jersey, Rob Coughlin. You can join their ranks and receive ad-free episodes by going to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Remember that you can join the mailing list to be notified about new episodes and news about the show by going to the link in the description. Speaking of news, I'm happy to announce that Pax Britannica is now part of the Airwave Media Network. 
For other great podcasts, check out airwavemedia.com. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC.